Hi, Freunde der Dauerwerbesendung. Äh, willkommen hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server mit der ähm, Domain sillyhuhn.com und dem Namen Lasergurkenland. Wir schauen heute ein besonderes Video von einem besonders unbekannten Channel auf diesem Channel. Ähm, und zwar schauen wir heute von 28C3. Wo steht da? Ist es die... Ich habe keine Ahnung. Okay, ich habe keine Ahnung, was das für ein Channel ist. Ähm, The Science of Insecurity. Äh, ein Video von 2011 äh, und äh, let's go. Ja, und der Server hier, der Minecraft-Server, ist natürlich Lasergruppen und der ähm, Anarchie-Server ohne Regeln. Okay, und, it is ähm, time. So ja, I am let's very, go. very proud to introduce two very, very good friends of mine. Sergey and Meredith. Guys, give them the huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Ich glaube, in die falsche Richtung, oder? Warte mal. Kam ich nicht von der hinten? So this talk is about the science of insecurity. Ich hätte schwören können, ich komme von da. Ich komme nicht aus der Wüste, oder? Ja, ich bin richtig confused gerade. Okay, was We're going to da examine dann? from first principles what it is about exploits that makes them exploits in the first place and how we can use this systematic understanding to design and implement software in which, to borrow a turn of phrase from Dan Kaminsky, entire classes of bugs simply don't exist. But before I get going, I want to remark on the other talk this Congress that focuses on Turing machines, Cory Doctorow's talk yesterday on the coming war on general computation. We're going to hear a lot in the next hour about certain hazards of Turing complete protocols, and I need to make clear that what I'm inveighing against is Turing machine computational power in very specific places, namely the communication boundaries between Turing complete systems. Your CPU needs to be able to perform arbitrary computation. ICMP Echo does not. So, so that's an important distinction, and please keep it in mind. But more important than that are Corey's spot-on observations about how the sausage gets made, how lawmakers and vendors conspire to herd users into walled gardens where, oh, by the way, the folks doing the herding can lock out competitors and bleed those users to their heart's content. It's the oldest game in the book, and it's already underway in the United States. Right now, there's an initiative under development called Mystic, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which is really just the old carrot and stick game aimed at conning citizens into voluntarily giving up any possibility of anonymity online, which is really the same as free speech online when you get right down to it, by holding out the carrot of quote unquote safe walled gardens like the iOS app store and social networks like Google Plus where the price of admission is your offline identity, backed up with a stick made from the specter of spam and malware and evil cyber criminals on the filthy nasty internet. And no matter how rotten the carrot really is, the thing about human psychology is once someone has bought into lofty and nebulous promises about matters such as security, it becomes really hard to convince them that the carrot cake is a lie. So our other option is to break the stick, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I actually owe this observation to my husband, Len Sassaman, who passed away back in July. Uh, Len started out in... Uh, in this world as uh, an anonymity and privacy researcher. Uh, he was working on that at Kyle Leuven under Bart Purnell. Um, but in 2009, he shifted focus to the language theoretic security work that uh, I had started back in 2005 because he became convinced that the future of an open internet is completely dependent on us smoothing out the attack surface and taking away the ability of repressive governments to hold this the, to hold this threat over our heads. All right, so if all you take away from this talk is this, I'm going to be really, really happy. First of all, the vast majority of vulnerabilities come from protocol and message format designs that require you to solve problems that are really not solvable if you want to process them securely, you know, putting yourself into a catch-22 that you cannot escape from. When you try to set yourself up against the, the laws of physics, um, you fail. End of story. But the good news is that from a design perspective, we can route around this. We just have to think about how we design inputs and outputs in terms of formal languages and conduct our implementation accordingly. So, 
We have been living on borrowed time. Uh, when the NSA tells you that there's no such thing as secure anymore, they're probably not kidding. Um, about this time last year, Brian Snow was saying there's a security meltdown coming, and I, I think the last year pretty well bears out what he had to say. Aww. And this is not for lack of trying. Stick. I mean, there have been trustworthy computing initiatives dating back decades. If you go to any bookstore, you're going to see scads of secure coding books on the shelves. Uh, there are dozens of conferences dedicated to secure software engineering and theoretical security. Um, so much ink has been spilled on this. So many, you know, so many bits have been spilled on this, and software still sucks ass. And, and don't even get me started on hardware. We have the internet we have, and you know, how, how did we get here? Is, is, it, is everyone really just that incompetent and has no idea what they're doing? Or is something else at work? Well, it's a little of column A, a little column B. So what is it that we're doing wrong? Okay. I mentioned the laws of physics earlier. But really, our physicists are people like Bertrand Russell, Kurt Gödel, Alan Turing, the guys who tried to universalize mathematics from axioms. Now the problem that we as security researchers want to solve is more focused than the general problem that they wanted to solve. But we start in the same way, which is by formalizing the question. What is security? Is it holes for sneaking in executable code? I mean, that tends to be how people look at it, but that's looking at everything in isolation. Um, furthermore, you don't necessarily have to have uh, an obvious hole in order to execute, you know, say, a return-oriented programming attack. Um, memory corruption, buffer overflows, um, in-band signaling, like Travis Goodspeed's packet and packet stuff, um, capabilities issues, access control issues, all of the above. You know, none of that is really sufficiently general and also sufficiently, and also sufficiently descriptive. Um, you know, I, I come from linguistics as a background, um, and we have this concept in, in linguistics of elegance, where an elegant description of a language is one that generates exactly strings that belong in the language, sentences that belong in the language, and none of the ones that don't. Now, if, if you think about, you know, the, those possible causes of insecurity that we just looked at, you know, Wikipedia is not much better. This, this, this laundry list here is just all over the map. Um, and if the classification looks arbitrary, what this is really telling us, you know, this is a lesson from the natural philosophers here. If the classification looks arbitrary, this means that we really don't understand the, the structure and the common origin of the phenomena that we're seeing. Um, so Jorge Luis Borges um, has, this, has this great description of uh, the classification of animals, you know, those that are belonging to the emperor, those that are embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, sirens, fabulous ones, stray dogs, those that are included in the present classification, and bonus points for anybody who gets what paradox that is. Um, you know, again, there's, there's no system to this. There's no rhyme. There's no reason to it. What we need is a way to go from the arbitrary Lamarckian classification where, you know, quails and hoofed mammals are, you know, sitting there in the same clade under reptiles of all damn things, um, and, move to, uh, and move to an understanding like Watson and Crick's understanding of DNA that has led us to the science of cladistics where we treat, uh, you know, where, where we treat classes of, or where, where we treat species um, as classes based on uh, common descent. You know, it's true that we can and we should classify exploits by similarity, but if we only look at the surface similarity and not the underlying structural similarity, we're setting ourselves up for failure. All right, so what does trustworthiness actually mean in a computing system? Well, Tony Hoare, um, the guy that came up with a little algorithm called Quicksort a while back, um, remarked in, in a paper in the 1960s um, that um, if uh, th that a program is correct if and only if um, it handles exactly the inputs it's supposed to handle and produces exactly the outputs it's supposed to produce and nothing else. 
we're not that good at this. We're, we're not that good at deciding whether an input is valid or malicious and rejecting the, uh, the, and rejecting the malicious ones. We're not, we, we don't have a good idea of how to trust software not to do certain things. Because how do you predict the unpredictable? Exploitation is simply unexpected computation caused by crafted inputs. So when you're asking the question, is it a good input or is it a bad input? Well, I mean, this is not a theoretical problem. Um, we've been talking about this in computability theory for you know 50 odd years now. Uh, we have this concept of undecidable problems, problems that you cannot solve regardless of how much computational power you have. Um, and some of these, and, and some unsolved, some undecidable problems have to do with recognition of inputs. You know, no general algorithm for solving these problems exists. So the networked world that we live in is a composed world. You have individual components that accept inputs, must accept or reject those inputs, and then generate some outputs. And these components communicate, um, and it's, it's necessary for these messages to be interpreted identically by the endpoints that send and receive them. Because you know, if, if Alice thinks she's telling Bob, um, you need to go to the store, and Bob hears, you need to go to the bus station, Alice isn't getting whatever Bob asked her to get. Or, 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 or yeah, Alice isn't gonna get whatever she asked Bob to get. Her. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk today about you know, how the halting problem arises in both the single component case and in the distributed case. All right, so how does, how, do, how does undecidability apply here? Well, in the single component case, some protocol formats are sufficiently complex that simply being able to discern a good input from a bad input is undecidable. And furthermore, some protocols are so complex that determining whether implementation A and implementation B handle them in the same way is also undecidable. All right, so we talk about recognizers as algorithms that examine an input string and determine whether that input string belongs in the language or not. For sub-Turing classes of languages, and we'll get into what those are in just a minute, um, the answer is either yes or no. For Turing complete languages, the halting problem says the answer is yes, no, or maybe. And if the answer is maybe, you're, you're never gonna know because the algorithm's never gonna stop executing. So when input recognition fails, the code on, on, the, on the inside of your, um, of your protocol, you know, the, the state machine of your protocol, is going to receive something that it wasn't expecting. Um, any primitives that it exposes can be uh, programmed, essentially, with input from an attacker to trigger memory corruption or implicit data flows, and a weird machine emerges. Um, Power Flake coined that term uh, to describe a more powerful execution environment than is intended, um, which, oh, by the way, you can program. So where do these show up? Well, the vast majority of uh, programs that uh, handle inputs scatter their validation checks throughout the entire program. Um, the, one, uh, the, one, uh, the one exception to this tends to be compilers. Um, and when your checks are scattered throughout the program, you know, it's, it's literally just like, you know, you took your 12 gauge and you fired a load of double lot at your, at your code and you know, wherever, the, <laughs> wherever the pellets landed, that's where your bones are. It, this is a horrible design pattern. I know, vaguely understood input languages are the mother of Ode. And a weird machine is born. <laughs> An adorable little root shell just pops right out. So, as Halvar said, exploitation is setting up, instantiating, and programming a weird machine. One of those uh, one of those holes that the uh, that the programmer inserted when he aimed his shotgun um, gets blitzed by some crafted input, and the state that the uh, 
uh, that the internals of the code enter into were not intended by the programmer, but you know what, they're there anyway. So, if we're going to understand this systematically, we have to look at this from the basics of computation as described originally by Alan Turing and Alonzo Church, but we have to think about it with regard to the lessons that we've learned from exploit programming. People like me study models of computation. People like Halvar and FX and all of our brilliant exploit guys study actual computational limits of real systems, and the great part is we meet in the middle. So, the Turing machine was the mathematical model that Alan Turing came up with to study the limits of what it is possible for a computation engine to perform. And he was able to formalize a class of problems for which no Turing machine can solve them. Um, the, uh, the initial uh, example problem that he described uh, is known as the halting problem because it turns on the question of whether a given Turing machine will halt, which is to say return yes or no, or end up in that infinite loop maybe state where you never get an answer back. Because you know, if the, even if the answer is yes or no, you have no idea how long you're going to have to wait. And if the answer is maybe, that answer is forever, but you're not going to know. All right. So if you say, I can take a universal, I can take a universal Turing machine, and I can execute another Turing machine on it, and that, that universal Turing machine is going to decide if the input will ever terminate, fail. Does not happen. If someone tries to convince you that they can do that, they are either stupid or malicious. Unfortunately, um, some designs, um, fortunately more of them, um, you know, on it, more of them in the composed uh, distributed system model, you know, where you've got two different implementations, um, end up reducing to an undecidable problem, um, which means that there really is no way to, uh, you know, to fix that problem as it exists. We can avoid it. Um, but fixing it requires a redesign. But there is no 80-20 engineering solution for the halting problem. If, so, if somebody is trying to sell this to you, then run away. If someone bought it on your behalf, fire them because you don't want to be around when it breaks. You know, and this is counterintuitive. You know, we're used to seeing more effort improve the result, but at the end of the day, you don't want to be the person who ends up slaving away for the rest of their life trying to just pour more and more and more and more effort down a bottomless hole. Okay, so a little bit more about uh, the, the history of halting, just to sort of give you an idea where we're coming from. So back in the 17th century, uh, a guy named Leibniz, um, you, you might know him as the, one of the inventors of calculus, asked the question, is it possible for a machine to determine whether an arbitrary mathematical statement is true? And he was kind of, he, he kind of worked on that in isolation during his life. Um, people thought he was a bit of a nut. Um, and then uh, Hilbert poses this again in 1928 um, in a list of um, in, a, in a list of problems that that he. Yo, das war äh, die Klingel. Um, das heißt, wir machen einen kurzen Cut. Um, wir sind hier auf Laserdokument im Kratzerei von Minecraft Server mit LP Silicon.com Alternativ 149.202.s7.s34. Äh, das Video ist 28C3, The Science of Insecurity. Wir sind bei 17 Minuten 57 und in der nächsten Episode geht's weiter. Ciao.